Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, another edition of Purdue ECE's Stories of Success seminar series. I'm very excited uh, that all of you are going to be able to join us tonight to hear from two of our distinguished alumni. Uh, if, for those of you that don't know who I am, uh, my name is Milan Kulkarni. I'm an associate professor at ECE. I work on sort of the computer engineering side of the department. I'm also the associate head uh, for teaching and learning. So, um, you know, if you have questions about your TAs or uh, your professors, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. <clears throat> um, so it gives me great pleasure uh, to be with you guys tonight and to introduce uh, two of our distinguished alumni, Kalpana Krishnamurthy and Siddharth Shet. Uh, Kalpana and Sid were uh, kind enough to, to fill me in a little bit on the details of, uh, of themselves uh, when we were chatting before the panel started. Uh, so they actually met at Purdue. They knew each other, sorry, they met before Purdue, but they started dating at Purdue uh, and got together and really, I think the rest is history. But let me tell you a little bit, not about their personal story, but about who they are. Uh, so Kalpana Krishnamurthy and Sid Shet are both uh, master's uh, degree recipients from Purdue. Uh, they both got their master's degrees in 1997. They're both out in Silicon Valley now, uh, having worked for a number of different chip companies and in a bunch of different roles. So Kalpana uh, is currently an independent consultant, but she's worked for kind of a who's who of uh, chip companies and semiconductor companies over the course of her career out in Silicon Valley, and she's done a tremendous amount of project management work. So if you have questions about what that kind of job is like, uh, I think she'd be more than happy to field them. Uh, Sid has also worked for kind of a who's who of uh, semiconductor companies and chip companies and things like that, including companies like Intel. Uh, he also has gotten into the startup scene, and he's currently working uh, for Infi Corporation, where he's working on their networking business. Um, and so I think he's had a lot of experience at kind of companies at all levels of the food chain um, out in Silicon Valley. So they're both uh, very distinguished alumni of Purdue. We're very glad to have them with us here uh, to share their wisdom with us and to answer your questions. Uh, to field those questions, I also want to uh, introduce Isaac, who is a third year student in ECE. Uh, so he is going to be helping out by moderating the panel, uh, fielding your questions and presenting them to Kalpana and Sid. And I hope you guys came armed with lots of ideas and lots of questions. And I'm really excited to see where this conversation goes. I'll talk to you again at the end of the panel. Thank you, Professor Kakari. Um, so just to kick things off, uh, uh, Siddharth and uh, Kalpana, if you guys could just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're currently doing right now. Sure, I'd be happy to kick this off. Uh, so first of all, you know, I'm hoping everyone, you know, we're obviously living in some very challenging times. Uh, in 2020. It's uh, turned out to be a more challenging year than most people thought. So hopefully everyone and their loved ones are doing safe. I wanted to thank uh, Purdue ECE for giving us this opportunity because, uh, you know, uh, as we were talking about a little earlier, you know, when we came to the United States, Purdue was the first place, pretty much the first place that we came to. So it has been a huge part of our uh, American experience, a very formative part of our American experience. So, you know, whenever we get a chance to give back to the school. Um, you know, we always never miss the opportunity. So hopefully we can share our story with you today and uh, answer a few questions for you that will make, uh, make this productive for you guys. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I was born and raised in India, uh, in the Western part of India and a state called Gujarat. And I come from a family of uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, my grandfather, both paternal and maternal were entrepreneurs, one in the paper business, the other one, the auto spare parts business. My dad, uh, he actually came to the US in uh, the late 1950s, uh, you know, probably a pioneer at that time. Not many folks from India used to come here at that time. Um, studied at University of Michigan, got a graduate degree, uh, went back and uh, did, uh, uh, you know, uh, built up a factory that was, that built, uh, you know, conveyor belt chains for fertilizer plants. And then I kind of followed in his footsteps. I also landed up in the Midwest and uh, went to Purdue uh, for my graduate uh, study. And um, I have been part of, I started my career at Intel, worked on the first, uh, you know, I've been a semiconductor guy pretty much for the last 25 years. I started my career at Intel, worked on, at that time, the first one gigahertz uh, Pentium 3 processor, you know, back when clock speeds in uh, processors was all the rage. Um, and then I kind of got into uh, uh, the entrepreneurial side of things where, um, I, you know, I, I worked for a few startups uh, and incubated a few businesses. Now I'm on to my fourth entrepreneurial venture. Uh, it's a company called D-Matrix. You see the logo up there. Uh, we are actually building an AI silicon and software solution. We are still in stealth mode, which is the reason, you know, we don't put the name out there yet. But, you know, obviously for the ECE 
folks. I'm happy to share a lot more information about what we are doing. Uh, but we are building an AI silicon and software solution that is being used to accelerate uh, AI workloads in data centers. And these workloads are specifically workloads like conversational AI and things like recommendation engines that are used to recommend friends and news feeds and so on and so forth. And companies like Google, Facebook, you know, Amazon, et cetera, would use the solution to accelerate uh, these huge AI workloads in their data centers. And that is, that is a class of problem that we are working on at uh, Dmatrix. And uh, so that's, that's a little bit about myself. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for having us here. I'm really excited to be able to share some of my experiences and stories with all of you. Um, uh, a little bit about myself, I'm Tamil and uh, from India. And, uh, you know, my father used to work for the government of India as an officer in the Indian Administrative Service. So we lived in so many different cities and districts. He had a wide swath of responsibilities, uh, which really impacted the lives of many thousands of people. So growing up in this milieu at home really informed me, um, informed my views and my opinions. So really, our, you know, I grew up in a very liberal, open, cosmopolitan type of home. Education was important, but not very overt, overtly so. Uh, I remember being surrounded by books. And as a little girl, I, I really remember being you know, very scientific, had a great love for science and technology. Um, I, I, you know, I was like a, like a little nerdy and geeky. And you know, when I moved into high school, I loved math, physics. And then in college, it was all about communications, computer architecture. You know, I, I still love science fiction. You know, you know, I grew up with Star Trek, Star Wars, uh, Cosmos. Um, I remember reading, you know, the Foundation series by Asimov, just loving it. So anyways, um, you know, after, uh, after graduating with a master's um, from Purdue, uh, both Sid and I went to, came to the Silicon Valley. My very first job, was at Sun Microsystems, and I actually was working on the floating point um, architecture and design for uh, their UltraSpark microprocessor, which I thought was like the coolest thing possible. Uh, and uh, I did a variety of roles, both on the engineering and business side. Um, and anyways, today, I think one of my most favorite role is that of being a mom to my two boys. Uh, our two boys are eight and 10. Um, and anyways, um, I, I really would uh, love to instill the same love for science and technology that we had, I had growing up in them. And also with, uh, you know, all the kids in their school. Uh, so I do spend a lot of time volunteering with their elementary school and, and that's been quite fulfilling. Awesome stuff. Um, so coming from abroad, what made both of you choose Purdue for college? So, um, you know, as, as all of you know, Purdue's engineering program uh, is, is really one of the best in the world. Um, and once I got into the electrical engineering program, I was really excited. Of course, uh, one other reason is when I found out that Sid was also going to Purdue, that, um, uh, that pretty much sealed the deal. So I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think in my case, uh, besides you know, after I knew where Kalpana was going, I thought I was following her, but now I'm finding out that she was following me. Well, <laughs> you know, we love to talk about that. <laughs> but uh, obviously Purdue is one of the best uh, engineering schools out there. And I think in my case, I would say, you know, when I was uh, in my undergraduate, I had a love for digital signal processing and uh, computer networking uh, specifically. And uh, when I look, you know, went through all the different universities in, in the United States, and I felt, you know, Purdue had some very good professors, research courses, uh, in the area of digital signal processing and, and computer networking. So that, that definitely played a very big role. And, you know, actually, um, after I graduated from Purdue, I've actually worked in many jobs and uh, done a lot of work. In fact, I spent 20 plus years in the area of computer networking. Um, so, you know, I've kind of continued through with my passion. And I think Purdue has played a very, very important role in, in laying the foundation uh, for all the work that I did uh, after I graduated. Awesome. Um, so I'm sure you guys made plenty of memories while you're here at Purdue. Um, do you have any favorites that come to mind? Um, yeah, I think the first semester 
was, uh, was quite amazing. I, I remember living at the young graduate dorm at that time. I mean, this was the first time for us being in a foreign country. Uh, and I was all by myself living in this international dorm, you know, with students from all over the world. That was quite phenomenal. Um, I think they had socials every week. And, and coming from India, it was quite a life-changing experience, you know, meeting and interacting with such a diverse set of people from all of these different backgrounds. So, so yeah, I think that was, uh, that was quite something. I think for me personally, I remember the HK and lounge and the donuts and the coffee every morning. I think I got to give it to that. I mean, that was something I just <laughs> so looked forward to every morning because, you know, you'd be sitting up all night in many instances, either doing your homeworks or assignments, you know, we spent a lot of time in the ECE lab and, uh, you know, I would look forward to, to uh, the seven o'clock, you know, donuts and coffee at, at the HKN lounge, you know, did some socializing, would typically go back and either continue working or go get some sleep. But, you know, that was a tradition. I mean, it almost became like a tradition for me is, you know, the last um, semester specifically, I, I remember spending a lot of time at the HKN lounge. Yeah, we love the HK Lounge here. Um, just to backtrack a little bit, uh, one of the questions from the chat uh, from Gabby, uh, what do you guys do for your, uh, with your sons particularly about um, teaching them programming and electrical engineering? Um, how do you get them involved? So, so you know, right now they're eight and 10. Uh, I, I, I feel like they will eventually learn programming. So by the time they get into middle school, um, I mean, at least the schools out here do have uh, computer science and programming as courses that they offer in, at, at the middle school level. So I haven't placed a lot of emphasis on, you know, having them learn actual coding. Uh, now in school, they do have a lot of apps on their iPad. Uh, so they do get exposed to, um, you know, doing some amount of coding by having fun, uh, you know, with those apps. There's Minecraft Education and a bunch of others. Um, so that's sort of, you know, I, yeah, that's, that's, that's been my philosophy. But, but, you know, like they do other things. Um, I like them to get involved with, you know, things that they can build. So a lot of science related projects. Um, you know, I have little kits they use to actually do experiments, build stuff. So there's a lot of building in addition to, of course, the usual Legos. Um, yeah, I think at this stage, we are trying to get them excited about the foundational yeah. principles of science and math. Yeah. And uh, coding and uh, programming is, is coming. It's, it's coming. And yeah. once they get into it, you know, they'll, they'll be spending many hours doing that. Right. Yes, I can attest to that. Yeah. Um, um, so do you have any uh, favorite classes from Purdue uh, that you remember fondly? Uh, yes. So in my case, as I mentioned earlier, I, I just love computer architecture and I really got exposed to it, um, you know, at Purdue. So I remember taking the ECE 565 course and that was really amazing. And then I also took the advanced level 600 level course. Um, it was advanced computer architecture following that. So those, um, those were some of my favorite courses. I think in my case, you know, I, I enjoy uh, being hands-on and doing something. I just enjoy the process of creating something. So I enjoyed uh, the courses that were more at, you know, practical assignments tied to it. The one I remember was a, a projects course that I did with uh, Professor uh, Kaushik Roy. Um, I think we created a, a reconfigurable FIR uh, uh, chip uh, in architecture that uh, we eventually, uh, you know, we obviously published some work around it and then published a paper and there's an interesting uh, story around that. Uh, uh, you know, when we graduated, when I graduated and I was on this project with, with one of my colleagues, uh, Jim, uh, who was, um, who's now actually CEO at Lattice uh, Semiconductor. Uh, and we were both graduating at the same time. And, uh, and we wrote this paper and uh, we both joined Intel. And uh, we wanted to publish this paper and present this paper. So we turned it into a conference called uh, FPGA. This was 1998. So we turned this paper into FPG in 1998 and uh, we actually got, you know, a chance to present this paper. So we went in there and, um, you know, FPGA 98 was all about FPGAs, you know, field programmable gate arrays. And uh, here were two guys from Intel who showed up there to present a paper. And, you know, the talk at the conference was all about, oh, is Intel getting into the FPGA business? Because that, those were the days when Intel was, you know, at the top of the world. It was one of the top chip companies, still is. Uh, but I mean, it, 
there was, you know, in those days, people kind of trembled when they heard about Intel getting into a new area, right? So when they heard this, you know, about two bunch of guys coming in there presenting a paper on FPGAs, uh, you know, we got a barrage of questions. I mean, is Intel getting into the FPGA business? You know, what's the deal? And we were like, we were just not prepared for that. So I distinctly remember that, but that was obviously a course that I enjoyed a lot because we actually did something that eventually went into a conference. We presented that, it had an impact. And uh, that's, that's something I remember a lot. Awesome, awesome. Um, so if I remember correctly, you guys said that you uh, met at Purdue. Is there, a, is there any story behind that or? Well, um, you know, as I, I was telling Melinda earlier, we were classmates in our undergrad. And when I found out that Sid was going to Purdue, um, you know, that, that really was a factor in my decision. I still remember uh, when I landed in Purdue in January at the height of winter with like, I don't know, two feet of snow and Sid came to the airport to pick me up. So that was, I, I was really happy to see him. And I think just spending a lot of time together, we really got to know each other. And I think Purdue really, you know, really helped there. It um, made a big difference. And so we started dating. Um, and eventually, you know, I've, I've been, I've spent the last 20 years of my life with my best friend and I really have Purdue to thank. Um, I think some of the most, my most favorite memories are of our courtship are from, you know, our time spent together at Purdue. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before we transition into uh, the career aspect of uh, the discussion, um, another question from the chat. Uh, so from uh, UA Wong, do you have any uh, suggestions for students who are interested in getting into uh, AI um, for a career position? Yeah, absolutely. No, happy to address that, right? Um, I mean, AI is a burgeoning field. I mean, uh, you, know, you know, if you go back and see when AI has been around for 60 years, right? Uh, it has gone through a number of nuclear winters over the years. And it was only in 2012 that uh, there was a resurgence in AI because of uh, what they call the Big Bang uh, in, in AI, which was essentially there was this uh, paper that was published in 2012 uh, called about AlexNet. And uh, they found that, uh, you know, NVIDIA based uh, GPUs can actually take that AlexNet model and they were able to up the accuracy on inferring with that model by 10 percentage points, right? So I think that had never happened before. There was like this quantum leap because of what computing and big data had enabled. So I think that was the first time when people kind of went back into doing more work with AI. And there's been a steady increase in interest in the field after that. In fact, the number of papers that get published in the, in the field are like, uh, you know, it's twice the number of papers that uh, then, then Moore's Law, right? So I think yeah, it, is, it is exponential in its growth. The models are you know, the actual AI models are increasing in size exponentially too. So there's just a lot of stuff happening. So my advice to anyone who wants to get into AI, there's multiple places that you can, uh, can uh, target. You can go after the software, you can go after algorithms, you can go after compilers. I mean, this is the entire hardware and the software is going to have to be reworked to accommodate AI workloads. So there is just so much that you can do. So it really is, is something very personal. Uh, if you enjoy working in the software layer, there is things you can do to optimize software. If you enjoy uh, hardware, you can work on new domain specific architectures. Um, and that's what we are doing at Dmatrix. It's an, an entirely new hardware software co-design problem. So, you know, my, my advice to, to anyone who's interested is, you know, first try out different things, see what really interests you, and then go deep into a particular area to optimize uh, performance around these AI workloads. Thanks. Um, so as you kind of think back on your experiences and all the knowledge you've built up over the years, um, what is one thing that you know now that you wish you had kind of known when you were in college? Uh, you know, I really wish I had sought out um, a mentor or someone that I could have bounced ideas off, someone more experienced uh, professionally early on, uh, you know, to, uh, in my career. Because, I mean, we kind of just, um, at, you know, I graduated from Purdue, we just, you know, joined our jobs and we sort of just, you know, jumped headlong into it. But there were so many things that I was unaware of. Um, I, I think having someone who had the experience, uh, who could have guided me or at least informed me of, you know, this is, these are the different career paths, these are, these are the different, 
you know, kind of roles in a company, it will really help me navigate uh, my career better. So I, I do think just reaching out to people in the industry who are more experienced and, uh, you know, getting some, uh, getting information, getting knowledge from them or trying to build a relationship, I, I you know, I would um, strongly recommend that. Uh, also along those lines, just, um, you know, building relationships with people in your industry, joining peer organizations, either within the company or in the industry is, um, you know, that that's definitely beneficial. And, you know, going back to my Purdue days, I think the one advice I really have for students is take care of yourself. I felt like I, there were like too many sleepless nights. Um, you know, I was just eating whatever. Of course, when we first came to the US, we never had like fast food in India. I just remember, you know, uh, going, on, going on a diet of, uh, um, of like Burger King and Taco Bell and, and uh, Subway. And I mean, that was, it was just amazing. But yeah, basically just taking care of yourself, eating well, sleeping, exercising. I think it's, you know, just making sure you're mentally and physically doing, doing well uh, or reaching out for help if you need it. I think those things are, are important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, from your perspective and experiences, what, uh, what advice would you offer to students who are nearing uh, graduation and starting to transition to this uh, post-COVID uh, professional world? Yeah, no, that's a very relevant question, right? I mean, uh, and obviously, you know, we are speaking to mostly uh, ECE students. Uh, so the one, one good piece of news I would say is, you know, most ECE students are actually playing into a favorable trend here, right? Uh, you know, we are moving to a work from anywhere. I don't like to call it work from home, right? It's really work from anywhere, a world, right? Uh, and uh, what that really opens up is you pretty much have access to any opportunity anywhere in the world. And uh, so gone are the days where you said, you know, hey, this is what I want to do. I like this company in terms of what they do. And I have to physically you know, locate myself close to that company. Uh, and most people try to do that. But I think those days are behind us uh, for the most part. Uh, people will work from anywhere. Uh, they might have to visit, you know, a certain office location uh, from time to time to maybe, you know, collaborate with their team or brainstorm with their team. But I don't think it's going to be an, something that you have to do on a daily basis. So that is where I would say that ECE students are very fortunate because, you know, there are certain kind of professions where you have to be physically present, right? If you're in the oil and natural gas industry or you work in a factory or something like that. But when you talk about ECE, you are obviously, you don't have that uh, restriction. So, you know, consider yourself fortunate, take advantage of it, focus on the what as opposed to the where, right? Uh, because now you have access to so many different opportunities. You can work for a company overseas uh, that is working on some really cool stuff that you are very passionate about. And that is an opportunity for you now, right? And you could be anywhere. And it is completely acceptable. It's amazing how much uh, has been possible uh, with this work from anywhere type of arrangement, right? I mean, it's very surprising. Just to give you an example, uh, you know, we are a small startup of about 10 people or uh, 12 people, and we have consultants who work from anywhere. We have partners that are in Asia and they work from Asia. And when COVID hit us, we were all essentially working from our homes or, you know, wherever. And we were actually able to build an entire chip. Uh, and none of us had ever done it before, right? We had, we actually built an entire chip without ever meeting in person for over a six to eight month period. And we were able to deliver it on time, right? So it was built entirely in the cloud. We used all the tools that were hosted in the cloud. Uh, and the team was all remote, not in the same physical location. And we were able to collaborate using online tools and still able to get this project done on time. So that was, and tape, yeah, exactly. And tape it out on time. So I think for us, I think for me personally, that was the biggest revelation of what is possible, even in, under extremely tight, constrained situations, you can still get stuff done in, a, in this collaborative fashion. So just something to keep in mind. Um, I think companies are very open. Companies you know, in, in the Valley, elsewhere, have now pretty much made it optional for people to come to work. So you know, take advantage of it and uh, uh, focus, on the, focus on the what and not the where. Awesome, awesome. Um, on the topic of advice, another question from uh, the chat from uh, Parthik. Uh, what advice do you have for a product design team working on a project that might have probably less than a year uh, to capitalize on the market demand of the market? You know, that happens all the time, right? We are in a very, very fast paced uh, environment. The technology is moving very rapidly. Uh, there's just too many discontinuities and disruptions happening in the market. And, you know, things like 5G and 
AI and cloud and edge computing, and there's just so many trends that you have to you have to move very quickly. Once you pick something you want to build and you make a bet on a market and a product, I think uh, the teams and the companies that can execute very quickly and deliver products on time uh, are the ones that are going to succeed. And uh, to me personally, you know, having a cohesive culture in a company where people can work and collaborate together. Um, and, um, you know, you know, the teams are comfortable with making progress with 80% of the data, as opposed to waiting for hundred percent of the data to emerge, right? Most of the times you're making decisions without really having access to hundred percent of the data. And you have to be comfortable making a bet and a decision to just to move quickly. Don't get into this analysis paralysis phase, but you just keep collecting data and don't make a decision, right? So those kind of attributes are very critical for uh, teams and companies to have to be able to operate in this fast-paced environment. Thank you. Um, so during your academic career, you both earned uh, graduate degrees in electrical engineering. Um, how would you say this, uh, this has helped you in uh, your uh, professional career? So it, uh, it really helped me become a better business person, um, believe it or not. So I uh, really, Purdue really helped me uh, acquire a very strong foundation, you know, uh, foundational principles in, in subjects like computer architecture and VLSI design. So I did spend seven years in engineering working on, you know, multiple chip design projects. And then when I transitioned into product marketing and product management at semiconductor at Marvell Semiconductors, I, I actually had worldwide responsibility for all of their consumer processor platform products. And I, I had to engage with a lot of tier one uh, OEM customers worldwide, you know, whether it was Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, EU. And, and at the end of the day, all of these customers that I was engaging with were engineers. I was trying to convince them to, uh, you know, to try our products out, uh, you know, to kick off an engagement or evaluate it, uh, to design it in eventually. And I, you know, I'd go into these meetings, they were mostly engineering meetings. Of course, I had my engineering team, but given that I had also been an engineer in my past life, it was very easy for me to be able to keep up, to communicate with them, uh, you know, and, and actually build credibility and earn their trust. I also, you know, had to work closely with my engineering team, you know, to come up with a good product spec, you know, take the customer requirements back to the factory, make sure that we were eventually actually building um, something that the customer would consume. So, so I think that, so having the strong foundation in, in WE really made a very big difference um, for me. Thank you. Um, so one of the common dilemmas for college students is uh, the option of graduate school versus the full-time uh, job market. And so what advice would you give to students who are thinking about those two options, especially with uh, COVID and uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a, there's no right answer right there. I mean, that is a dilemma that has been around, you know, when I was in graduate school, right? Should I, should I graduate? Should I, uh, you know, should I take, uh, enroll into the PhD program? I actually uh, do remember enrolling into the PhD program at Purdue and I, you know, thought I would continue down that path, right? Um, till I decided to change my mind. So it's a, it's a very personal decision. I don't think there's any right answers. Um, I think my advice to people would be that uh, if you're looking at uh, doing a graduate degree, um, there's probably a good reason why you're looking at doing it is because you are either very passionate about the area that uh, you want to pursue a graduate degree in, you want to learn a lot more, go deeper, uh, explore new areas of research, right? And that becomes a very personal decision. So I think, you know, that is something, whether we are in a COVID world or a non-COVID world, you would, you should do it. That's something you should just do because you're passionate about that. Uh, now, in terms of the, you know, a career and a job market, right? I mean, this is obviously a fantastic time to be out there looking for, if you're an ECE graduate, this is probably one of the best times to be out there looking for, for a job, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, there's just so many, so many things happening. There's just so many areas of disruption and technology and innovation that, you know, finding, finding a job, I mean, all the tech companies are doing extremely well, right? Um, so I think, you know, if you want to really go out there and look for a job, this is probably one of the best times to be out there. 
Um, so I think it's an embarrassment of riches, really. I mean, I would, I would look at it that way, right? I mean, if you are graduating with an EC degree, you have the option to stay back in school and go deep. And you can probably learn a lot more about all these new burgeoning areas. We talked about AI a little bit. I mean, that's another you know, area you know, prime for research. There's just so many things going on there. And, uh, and if you want to look for a job, you'll find one very comfortably too. So again, it's, it's, uh, it's a personal decision. Um, no right answers here. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's something you need to think about in terms of what is it that you really want to do. And I don't think you'll ever be wrong. It doesn't matter which path you pursue. Thanks. Um, to kind of expand on that, um, a two-part question from uh, Hamid Reza. Um, how do you compare the market atmosphere today with the time that you ventured into business? And then the second question, what uh, portion of your experiences do you think is transferable to uh, newly grads? Yeah, so I'll take the first one. Um, I mean, comparing the times, probably, you know, similar, I would think, because all these things go in economic cycles. And, you know, when we graduated in 97, 98, uh, we had uh, what was known as the dot-com bubble uh, of, of the late 90s. Uh, the internet had just uh, come in and, uh, you know, people were, uh, you know, the internet was all the craze. There was companies getting formed in the valley almost, you know, every day around uh, some new product being sold on the internet or some new service being offered on the internet, new hardware and chips being built uh, for the internet, right? So I think uh, uh, it is, um, it was, and now you're kind of, you know, 20, 25 years later, you're in a very similar position. There's just so much more innovation in AI and cloud that uh, it's kind of a similar time from a job market standpoint. You could have gone out in the market in the late 90s or in the late uh, 2010s um, and you would, you would, you would have the same reception. There's plenty of opportunity. Um, the second part of the question, could you repeat that for me again, uh, Isaac? Yeah, um, sorry, My, there it is. Uh, so what portion of uh, your experiences do you think is transferable to newly grads? Yeah, um, what portion of my experience? I mean, um, it is really, um, you know, what you learn as you, as you kind of go on this journey, right? The last 23 years, um, you know, I have always believed that it is important to try out different things, especially early on in your career. You want to not limit yourself in terms of what all you can learn, whether it's uh, trying out different functions. Uh, you know, you can try out a business function. You can try out an engineering function. Um, you can uh, try out different areas. So if you want to go down the engineering function or be on the technology side, you can, you can try out, you know, whether it's AI or, you know, we talked about all these different uh, innovations happening in the market. Um, so spend the first five to 10 years learning, which is what I did. Um, and then you pick an area that you really are passionate about and you go down that path, right? And you go deep. And um, I mean, that's, that's what I've done in my 20 years. I, I would probably advise students uh, along similar lines. Um, I'm assuming I'm, that's the question the person was asking uh, and I'm answering the right question, but that's, that's what I would essentially advise people to do. Thanks. Um, so one of the important things for engineers is uh, how you define success of a uh, problem or succeeding in solving a problem. So um, in general, uh, how do you both define success in the work that you do? So I'll go first and then give it to Kalpana, but in my, you know, uh, the way I define success is really working with the right people, uh, preferably working with people smarter than yourself so that you're always learning and, um, and, and doing something that makes an impact, right? You always want to work, at least for me, I want to work on something that moves the ball forward, doesn't matter where. So I enjoy the process of creating something. Uh, and then, and then, you know, at the end of it, you want to have created something that has moved the ball forward in your area, in your chosen field, right? Uh, just to give you an example, I mentioned earlier, I was, uh, I spent 20 plus years in the computer networking field, right? From uh, the early 2000s to pretty much last year when I moved into AI. And um, in those 20 years, you know, I worked on uh, advancing network speeds from, you know, one gig, which is when I moved into computer networking, you know, most of the networks were running at one gigabit per second. And by the time I left in 2019, uh, you know, my previous company, Infi, uh, where I was running the data center business had launched an 800 gig connectivity solution, right? So we had gone by a factor of 800 in those 20 years. We went from one gigabit network speeds to 800 gigabit network speeds, right? And I had the, the opportunity to work with some of the smartest people along the way. We had a number of 
products that were world's first type of products that we launched along the way. And that was strictly because of the quality of the team that I was working with, right? And uh, you then have an opportunity to make that impact. You, you kind of do things that the world has never done before. And that to me is, is, is my definition of success. It just leaves me very satisfied. Yeah, and for me, it's, um, uh, it's, it's all about the people and the community. And as I said, said you know, having an impact and really making a difference um, you know, in the lives of uh, the people that I am surrounded with. So right now, um, you know, uh, I am volunteering a lot with our, uh, with our elementary school. And that's, uh, and it's, it's an amazing way to actually, you know, have an impact in my community to make a difference in the lives of all, you know, the kids that my kids uh, are going to school with. So I, just for the last two years, I was co-chairing a huge, um, uh, a, a fundraising event, uh, which is like a walkathon and a silent auction. Uh, and, and it was, uh, you know, it was very fulfilling to be able to do that, to organize this walkathon where, you know, a thousand people from our community, including parents and kids showed up and, you know, they walked for the whole day and raised funds for the school. And, and as part of the silent auction, you know, we kind of organize events throughout the year, which builds the community, you know, whether it's for the parents or the kids. And, and, you know, we kind of raised like uh, a, a quarter million dollars for the school, which was great. But then, you know, we also sort of built greater ties um, within uh, the neighborhood itself. So, yeah, I think those things are important. Awesome. Um, continuing along the lines of success, uh, you both have had uh, very remarkable and broad careers. Um, what would you attribute your successes to? Um, I think, um, you know, there's a number of, you know, and this is probably a recurring theme in my responses, right, is because there are certain fundamental principles by which I, I live my life and, you know, navigate my career, right? But uh, as I stated earlier, I think there was a question along similar lines that I just answered. But uh, to me, you know, you want to, at least in the early part of your career, uh, you don't want to limit yourself because you're afraid that something may not work out, right? Uh, you want to you want to put yourself out there, try out different things. It's okay to fail. I mean, it's really okay to fail. First ten years, you know, doesn't matter. It's okay to fail. I mean, the amount of stuff you learn when you fail is way more than the amount of stuff you learn when you succeed, right? So I I really believe just put yourself out there first ten years, try out different things. That is your time to experiment. That is your time to learn, and then you will eventually find the thing that you really want to pursue uh, and spend more time on. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, in my case. Uh, you know, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, right? And uh, it's not like I started my career as an entrepreneur. I went to Intel and I worked in, you know, two or three different groups at Intel, right? I tried out different groups. I worked on, uh, you know, uh, a couple of projects along the way. Um, and I just felt it was a very big organization for me, right? So it was not really tapping into my entrepreneurial instinct. So then I went to a very small group within Intel and I really was, you know, I really enjoyed it a lot more. So then I stepped outside and joined my first startup. And uh, this was you know, 2000, 2001, when the dot-com, you know, bubble had just begun to burst and then 9-11 happened and the startup didn't make it. I mean, it lasted, you know, barely six months. Um, and, uh, you know, that could have, you know, deterred me, right? I could have said, you know what, I want to go back to the safety of a big company. That's really what I, but no, I, I think I had gotten enough of a taste where I said, you know what, I'm going to go into an even more riskier endeavor, right? And I went to a startup with just three people, right? So it was something way more risky than the previous startup. And that turned out to be a very rewarding journey for me. It was a 10 year journey with some amazingly wonderful guys. Uh, we built a company over 10 years. The company was eventually acquired and I made some lifelong relationships. We built some products that had never been built before. So, but I think it, it, that's, that's, I think one key ingredient to success in my mind is you got to go out there, not be afraid of failure, try new things. Uh, don't be afraid of falling. You know, you can always dust yourself and get back up. And uh, you almost always will find the stuff that you really enjoy and are passionate about. So, but the only way you're going to find it is if you try. Yeah. And along those lines, you know, just having a willingness to learn. So having like this mindset where you're constantly learning and not like stopping that process and getting stagnant. I think that um, that's an important, um, you know, attribute as well. Awesome. Um, so in general, how do you uh, work to approach tough decisions? 
Oh yeah, that's uh, that's all, that's always. Uh, I mean, you know, tough decisions. I mean, I would tell everyone in the room, right, is uh, get used to it. There's going to be a lot of uh, tough decisions you're going to have to make in your careers, right? And uh, the key thing is to embrace it. I think don't shy away from ever making a tough decision. Uh, embrace uh, the situation that you are in. Uh, and again, goes back to what I stated earlier. Uh, don't don't worry about you know getting all the data to make that decision, right? Uh, you're never going to get all the data to make a decision. It doesn't matter how tough it is or how easy it is also in some cases. Um, you have to go with, there's an element of instinct and gut in every decision. And there's an element of gathering data in every decision, right? So you always want to gather that data and see whether the data that you collected validates what your instinct has been telling you all along, right? Because your instinct is almost always telling you what to do, right? And you may not want to believe it, because you may not have the confidence and what gets you the confidence is collecting that data, but don't wait to get 100% of the data. You're never gonna get 100% of the data. So collect 80% of the data, 70% of the data. At some point, the data will validate your instinct and then you can go make that decision. That's what I've followed as a principle. And you know, for the most part, it has worked. And you know, sometimes it doesn't work, okay? So I'm not gonna say that you know, I've been right 100% of the time, but don't try to be right 100% of the time, right? Uh, you're not, not gonna be right. It's about being making good enough decisions and don't look back. Once you made a decision and picked a path, the key thing is to embrace that decision and make the best of it. Because at the end of the day, the decisions are, you know, you, you make a decision right, right? So don't, don't be afraid of making a decision at some point and going forward and making it a good decision for you. Awesome. Um, in terms of decisions, uh, we're definitely taught ethics a lot at Purdue. And so another question from uh, uh, Thaddeus, uh, is there anything in AI that scares you and are you optimistic that it won't be exploited for such purposes? And I guess you know, it's always good to be paranoid. It's always good to be paranoid and we should be paranoid, right? I mean, uh, you know, because AI is a tool. At the end of the day, it is how we use it, right? How we human beings use it. And, uh, you know, there have been, you know, you can point back to many discontinuous inventions and innovations that happened over the last, you know, two, 300, 400 years, right? And, you know, I'm sure when, you know, the first car came along and people said, you know, people could do, oh, why, why, you know, I mean, we could misuse these cars for, for a lot of different things, right? But, you know, and eventually cars were used to move people from point A to point B in a lot more efficient fashion. Uh, AI is something similar, right? It is a tool and it is meant to take certain tasks and do them more efficiently, right? Uh, today, if you look at how people go about doing certain basic things, uh, they can be actually automated and, uh, you know, you could use AI and uh, free up uh, people and human beings from doing those you know, menial tasks and they could go work on something a lot more productive, right? So again, at the end of the day, it's a tool. Um, we should be concerned about, like any other innovation in history, uh, we should be concerned about how we use that innovation. But at the end of the day, I would tell, tell uh, the students that it is, it is a tool and it's up to us and it's the onus is on us about how we use that tool. And there's going to be many further innovations in the future. And the same question will keep coming up, the you know, question of ethics about how we use this tool. And again, it's, I, I believe in the goodness of, of, of humankind. And uh, history has shown us that we have typically used all these innovations for the better of uh, person kind. So I believe the same will be true for AI too. Thanks. Um, so can you describe one of the biggest challenges that you've faced individually in your career and uh, how are you able to overcome that? Um, you know, for me personally, I, I was a very shy person. Um, even growing up and also when I joined the corporate world, it was just so daunting for me. Um, you know, sitting in this room with like 20 people and having to speak up or, you know, share my opinions or, or comments. And oftentimes uh, I was probably one, the only woman or one of two. <laughs> so that, that dynamic sort of, you know, also um, added to, uh, you know, the fear of being able to just speak up. I used to get really tongue tied. So I think that was a big challenge because it's very important, um, uh, you know, to get heard, uh, to be heard and, and to speak up. And it was something that I had to really work on and, and chip away at, uh, you know, um, literally uh, one meeting at a time, one step at a time. And it, it's still something that I have to keep working at. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, I think we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, but uh, how do you balance uh, your personal life with uh, your work life in such a demanding field? So, uh, 
You know, it, we both Sid and I are just very disciplined um, about our, our time at home and at work. So it's, it's all about time management. You know, when our two boys were little babies, I, I remember we did have help. So we were fortunate, like we had family uh, for some time uh, and we had, you know, other kinds of help, like we had daycare, nannies. And uh, also I kind of learned to just sort of let go of a lot of stuff, outsource, um, you know, things. And, 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 you know, just being okay with letting go of certain things. So, so that helped. Uh, also, uh, Sid and I would make sure that we were coordinated. Initially, I remember when our, our older one was just, um, you know, a year old, I had to travel almost once a month <laughs> because there was a very pressing and critical engagement with one of our tier one customers. And it was something I had to do. And, and so we just made sure that, um, you know, we coordinated so that while I was traveling, you know, Sid was at home and, and, and you know, he pretty much took care of a lot of stuff. So, um, so it was, it, a lot of it was just time management. And, um, and also now in this post COVID world, things are really changing. And, and, and it's, it's, it's not just about balancing your work and life, but also about integrating it. I think people and, companies and, you know, in general, everyone's realizing that, uh, uh, you know, people have families, people are working from home. So the situation is more fluid. People are just getting more open-minded about people, you know, sort of letting their, you know, personal lives and their work lives just getting more integrated and, and more fluid. So, so people are becoming more flexible. And, and the other thing is I, I do want to be involved a lot with, you know, my two boys, you know, what they're up to, their school, their friends. And uh, so I, I just make time for that. That's very important for me personally. And I remember telling Sammy uh, when I met her, you know, I, I, I volunteered to become um, a soccer coach uh, for two years for my little one who's like just sports crazy and I've never played soccer before. <laughs> so, which was perfectly fine because, you know, all the kids were six and seven, so. <laughs> So, but yeah, that was, that was great, uh, you know, teaching them soccer, so. Awesome. Um, one of the things that Purdue has been emphasizing over the past few years is uh, taking small steps uh, towards your next giant leap. And so kind of the idea of your lifelong learning journey. Um, how do you view the importance of this idea of a lifelong, lifelong learning journey? Yeah, no, I think that's a wonderful message, right? I mean, that's really the only way I would think um, is, uh, you know, you got to take these small steps uh, to get to a big goal. Really, you have to. And uh, you now I'm a strong believer in the learn it all mindset as opposed to the know it all mindset, you know, constantly being a student, uh, constantly wanting to grow, uh, keep that growth mindset, right? Um, I mean, those principles will keep you grounded for life, right? It'll keep you humble. Uh, you'll find out about so much stuff that you don't know, right? Every time you keep an open mind and you are receptive, you will learn things uh, that you never knew you, uh, you thought you knew, right? Uh, so, uh, but you didn't. So, no, I'm a big believer. I think it's a very important thing to imbibe and embrace as part of your, or as your journey, as you go through life. Uh, it will, it'll keep you young. It'll keep you young because, you know, you will learn new things. You will be able to interact with a lot more people if you don't close your mind. To, to, to new things and new, new learning. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question from uh, the audience uh, from Partik. Uh, how do you see uh, India IT past COVID uh, in terms of the job market and innovation of ideas and what are your projections for the year? I think it should benefit uh, India uh, or any other country for that matter that has a strong IT presence because of what we just talked about earlier. Uh, you know, the work from anywhere trend is going to accelerate post COVID. Uh, there's no question about it. We are, we were already moving into a digital economy um, and now we're going to accelerate into a new digital world at, at a much faster pace. So that would basically mean that, you know, you can be collaborating with anyone anywhere in the world and it will, it will, uh, it'll be very productive, right? So I would, I would expect that whether it's uh, IT presence in India or China or any country in the world, which has a strong pool of IT talent, is going to benefit because because of this trend. 
So that would be my that would be my guess and my prediction in terms of what's going to happen. We're already seeing that, by the way. I mean, as I stated earlier, we worked with a team in in China and Taiwan that did our entire chip for us, and it was so you know there was a pool of talent there that was able to help us finish our project on time. So I think I would expect the same in other countries too. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to tie two questions together here. Uh, so. Where do you both see yourself in another five years and what are your current career goals? And then in terms of uh, your goals, uh, how has your experience in your life uh, really helped prepare you and also been relevant towards uh, those goals and your uh, experience? Uh, so as I stated earlier, you know, I really enjoy technology and science and, you know, uh, exploring new ideas. So moving forward, I do see myself supporting um, and incubating and investing in new endeavors, um, new entrepreneurs and ideas. Uh, in fact, I have uh, seen and supported um, Sid's latest venture, D-Matrix, at such close quarters. And uh, really, it's been the most thrilling <laughs> so far. Um, so yeah, I mean, if any ECE students um, are coming to the Silicon Valley or you know, would just like uh, to chat with us or talk to us uh, about, you know, any questions they might have or even new ideas, please, you know, reach out to me because that is what I see myself doing really, uh, you know, supporting, incubating and, and, and mentoring um, people and new ideas moving forward. Awesome. Um... So I guess what final piece of advice would you have for students uh, kind of in this uh, call as they continue with their academic journey? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I probably have touched upon a few things already in my previous uh, responses. Uh, but again, uh, my, my advice would be, you know, stay, uh, you know, keep a growth mindset. As I said, I, you know, keep a learn it all mindset, keep growing, explore, don't be afraid of failure, right? As I said, in the first few years of your career, you have the luxury to try out different things. So don't be afraid of, you know, falling and stumbling. It's okay. Um, make those mistakes. You learn a lot from that. Um, and, um, you know, uh, you know, I was, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, uh, a commencement speech by Steve Jobs at uh, the 2005 convocation at Stanford. Uh, it is, it is a very, you know, if you haven't, I would really recommend that uh, you go see that. Um, I saw, you know, he obviously gave that in 2005. And when I saw it, I'd already, graduated from school, you know, nine years, and it was still very relevant for me, right? There were a lot of life lessons in that, and I would really strongly recommend that you, that you go, go see that. But in that speech, you know, I want to quote him here, he talks about staying hungry and staying foolish. Um, and that was really the core principle uh, that is, is, in my mind, the ingredient to success, right? Is, is you got to go out there, listen to your, you know, your, you almost always know what it, what it is that you want to do, right? And, uh, but you're sometimes not confident enough or you are, uh, you know, skeptical in terms of should I pursue that path? Because you're getting advice from so many different people, right? Uh, saying, oh, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. You know, this is good for you, that's good for you. And so, how do you pick something? So, I think that's why it's okay to try, it's okay to go experience, it's okay to stumble, and um, and then eventually you will pick. You know, I, you know, I'm, I'm quite confident. You know, you will eventually pick the right path forward. Right? So, I think I would say, yeah, stay hungry, stay foolish, and uh, stay humble. I think key thing is to stay humble. Keep an open mind and learn, and don't let success uh, go to your head. Thank you. Um, I guess final question from the audience: um, Is there a, a rationale behind the design of your uh, D Matrix logo? Ah, yes. Uh, <laughs> good question. Yes. So you know, it's a it's a round uh, peg in a square hole. Uh, that's what we like to call it, right? Uh, if you look at that uh, red cube and uh, the and the black you know kind of circular ball in the middle um and uh, you know we always believe you know at least when we started the company we said the people who change the world are the people who are round pegs in a square hole so we wanted a logo that reflected that and that is what the logo is trying to reflect but i mean the technical reason would be also that uh, we are building a matrix math accelerator right at the end of the day when you're building an ai uh, hardware solution what you're fundamentally doing is you're building a matrix math accelerator and uh, we are trying to reflect a 3D matrix or a tensor with that cube structure that uh, we have in the logo. So yeah, that is, that is kind of the, the, that was kind of the thinking. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you for your time. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Professor Cole Carney. Okay. Thanks, Isaac, for doing such a fantastic job moderating uh, this panel. Um, I think you did a great job of synthesizing questions and keeping the conversation going. And really, thank you, Sid and Kalpana, for, for sharing uh, so much of your time and your, and your insight with us. Uh, it was great hearing both your stories of your times at Purdue and uh, your stories about your career since then. Um, I think uh, you've given a lot of the attendees here a lot to aspire to do. Uh, and I, I, hope that, uh, I hope that we'll see more of our grads following in your footsteps uh, in the future. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for, uh, for taking the time. Uh, I also wanna thank all of the attendees for joining us. Um, thanks for, for contributing to yet another one of our successful uh, webinars. And we, we look forward to seeing you at the next one. And uh, thank you all, have a good night and stay healthy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everybody.